Okay. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. I'm Tanya Semper. I'm handling the marketing and communications for Salient Medical. Joining us is Daryl Simpson <laughs> to my right. Uh, he handles all things sales, so definitely a, a mover and shaker for our organization. Uh, right to him is Jeff Sinclair. He is responsible for international sales. He travels all over the world and is right now in Seoul, Korea. Then we have to his right, Nahian Jacob. And Nahian is the global trainer. So she is helping all of our different accounts succeed with Vidiv around the world. And last, and of course our most important guest, is Dr. Michael Critchman, and I'll let Jeff take it on from here. Thank you very much, Tanya. Um, Again, my name is Jeff Sinclair, Vice President of International Sales for Aviv. I've been with Aviv for close to six years and have seen a rapid, rapid adoption of the technology um, Aviv um, 1 and 2. And I'm excited to say we have well over um, 400 systems installed worldwide with 30,000 procedures performed to date. Incredible results in the area of stress urinary incontinence and also improvement of sexual um, function with only one treatment. I'm very, very pleased today um, to have with us Dr. Michael Kreitschman as a doctor of sexual medicine, a board certified obstetrician and gynecologist and a clinical sexual counselor and author. Dr. Kreitschman has devoted his career to helping patients and their partners overcome sexual health challenges and experience a higher quality of physical intimacy. Um, Dr. Um, Kreitschman was originally um, from Canada and, and Quebec, and um, he obtained his um, medical education at McGill University, um, as well as his doctorate in medicine and master's in surgery. We're so lucky to have you here, Dr. Kreitschman. Um, thank you so much. I'll hand thank it off God. to you. Okay, I'm just trying to um, get technical um and um, let me uh, do I have to do this and let me do that okay can everybody can you guys see my slides yeah, yeah perfect Michael. Perfect. Okay. And can you hear me? Yeah. Excellent. Okay. So we're good to go. Okay. Um, thank you guys so much for the uh, great opportunity to speak with you. I, uh, I know some people are kind of wondering what this talk is going to be all about, but we're really going to kind of walk you through about um, technology and sexuality and really um, how it's not something new, it's something that we've seen for quite some time. And then I'm going to give you some uh, information really hot off the presses, how it pertains to devices and how it pertains to what we are all experiencing now. Um, right now, um, uh, things have changed dramatically for me. I used to be traveling 50% of the time. Now I have not traveled since March. Uh, uh, I am now in my new man cave, which is called my office, where one of my offices has transformed into telehealth only, so very technologically done. I have no staff because they've chosen not to return. So, you know, I always say I have three employees. I'm the uh, file clerk, I am the physician, and I'm also um, the MA and lab checker and what have you. So things have changed for everybody dramatically over the last six months and technology really has permeated almost every aspect of our life and sexuality is no change. So I kind of wanted to walk you through it and kind of give you an idea about sexuality, give you some new exciting information that's really hot off the presses and um, you know, and there are some uh, slides for you, Marianne and Jeff, uh, for you've heard this talk before, but there's new and exciting things that I just put in uh, late last night. So hopefully everybody will come away with some take home points. Um, 
So we see that there was, um, you know, a very big sexual evolution. You can see here, even in underwear, there's been a very big change and a very big change about sexuality where it was vilified, where it was almost outlawed. And then we came to a new resurgence. And then, you know, I think there is a return to some conservative concepts. And we'll talk about that, what happened recently with the FDA. But again, I think we are bubbling towards the surface with research and new developments that have really moved us in the right momentum. We see the changes both for men and men, even in uh, you know, grooming where we've transitioned and we're coming going back full circle in sexual health. Uh, what is appropriate is really, really about the times of uh, the culture in which you are living. What about vibrators? And I think that's a really important place to start in terms of history. We know that they have been around since the beginning of time. Um, it's thought that Cleopatra allegedly used a hollow gourd with angry bees as a vibrator. We know that in the 1800s, vibrators were used as medical therapeutics. So devices have been permeating um, gynecological health and sexual health since very early on. And you, I don't know if anybody has seen the movie Hysteria, but it's an interesting uh, um, movie about uh, patients would come with a whole variety of medical gynecological conditions, go to the uh, OBGYN who would use a uh, stimulator uh, or what it was called a power uh, manipulator, give women orgasm and they would have relief of their symptomatology. So the incorporation of technology really has been around forever uh, in terms of sexuality and sexual health. But moving forward, you can see the transition. You know, we see here um, first vibrators and now we have ones that are for uh, people that have special needs. We have ones that are made specially for women who have arthritis. We have the, you know, the ultimate in vibrator, a diamond encrusted one. And again, the Lilo, which has really gained popularity of the medical grade, multiple speeds and what have you. So we've come a long way from the original manipulator. And this just shows how the progression and interest and demand for technology and how it incorporates into our everyday lives is really quite vital. The new trend is the smart vibrator. These are ones and the um, at CES in Las Vegas, uh, the Lioness won an award. It's first to believe is the, the smartest vibrator that's available. And it's really about seeing is believing and you can use a vibrator, check the waves, know where you are appropriately being stimulated, plan for uh, different stimulations. There's biofeedback, and again, you have other ones that are bendable, movable, programmable, and individualized care is really um, very important in this respect. There's even things where we've used the internet. So the internet is also very important. We have uh, devices that can turn your cell phone into a stimulator. We have uh, remote controls, which is kind of the latest and greatest, where uh, you could be in the bedroom and your partner could be in Korea or could be in the upstairs den and they can incorporate self-stimulation. And believe it or not, these have increased in uh, popularity, demand, and um, sales over the last six months because of COVID, because of isolation, because of other issues of social distancing as well. So this is, the, this is called sexual distancing. So you can have sex with somebody and not even be in the same room. Um, we also see a transition in terms of, of, of chemicals and where we've gone for this concept of uh, a lot of things in uh, products for vaginal health. Uh, we're now trending towards no additives, parabens, glycerins. There's much more regulation. Um, and simplicity really is the uh, essence. Like less is more when it comes to vaginal uh, treatment and vaginal health as well. Um, we see the emergence of newer mo molecules. One of the ones that I'm very excited about is this M007, which is really a carrier transporter molecule, which is now incorporated into a variety of different vaginal products. Um, and this has really been shown to be very, very helpful. 
this is from a novel. It's a proprietary uh, transporter. It's from Omni Bioceuticals. They have a really very, very good vaginal moisturizer called VTAC. Uh, vaginal Treatment and Care is the expanded acronym. And it really helps. And it really is the concept of it's not just a topical concept. It's bringing uh, targeted growth factors, proteins, peptides, amino acids, cytokines, with this specialized concept of technological uh, molecule that brings it deeper into the surface. It's not just a, like a regular moisturizer that stays on the surface, it's actually going in much deeper. So very exciting, we've been using it in my center and it's something that's new, novel, uh, readily available and it's a great treatment for uh, vaginal dryness and post laser, post radio frequency, which has really shown to augment results. Um, of course, uh, talk about the advances in terms of uh, vaginal health and vaginal products. Cannabis, we cannot uh, ignore. It's been around. It's now super popular. Uh, CBD oil, THC for pain, for healing, uh, for all these different conditions. Certainly has been around for quite some time. Now very popular in a lot of products as well. So very, very hot in terms of uh, patients asking for CBD. And again, data is emerging on this respect. We know social media uh, really expanded exponentially. If any of you have children that have start, tried to start school on Monday, like myself, we can see that Zoom crashed, uh, created you know, a national crisis for the schooling issue. But again, um, now the whole challenge is you know, kids are uh, in school, uh, technically on Zoom, but texting as well. But tech Technology and sexuality has really been around for quite some time and you can see that it's really growing exponentially in terms of how we social interact and the pandemic really has not helped that as well. We're seeing explosions in TikTok, in uh, hookup apps, in dating apps, virtual bars and what have you. So technology really has permeated our social lives as well. We've seen that it's really about also driverless cars and new studies show that driverless cars are uh, leading to more uh, sexual activity. So as technology progresses, we're gonna not necessarily have more convenience for work to do work in the car. We're gonna actually have more conveniences to be more um, socially intimate with our partners and what have you. So technology and sex uh, really interact and we've seen a resurgence in these concepts like virtual sexuality, uh, virtual robotic um, interest, and that really has accelerated and really moved in the last six months really uh, exponentially because of this isolation, because of the concern of being actually with people, but people's sexual needs need to be met. Um, I think we need to be wary about gimmicky fads, and some of them are listed here, things like goop, things like, you know, the GIF tip, which is uh, supposedly just a kind of a band-aid over the tip of the uh, penis. Uh, there's all things like the intelligent condom, uh, condom for $75, and gives you, you know, feedback on thrusts, and it's supposedly supposed to tell you if um, it's venturing into STI land, uh, with sensors and what have you. You have all kinds of variety of things. And remember, sex sells. Sex is a very, very big business. Uh, there's a purchaser for every product. We have makeup for the vagina. We have bleaching creams. We have vajazzling. We have even a little nice tuxedo for uh, a man's penis if he wants a special night out as well. Um, and again, just up the street from me, they're promoting these concepts, which is, uh, you know, a vaginal steam, no science, no data, uh, detoxing the vagina. Actually, I've seen some women that have had third degree burns on their vaginal health for too hot, sitting too hot. Uh, while sitting on a pot, um, you know, and I think that's really important. So the, the concept of, you know, there's a purchaser for every product, sex sells, uh, really has been prevalent for quite some time, but there's really been a turn, a tide of turns in terms of looking at research. And we'll talk a little bit about that. And primarily, we've seen a lot of uh, things related to concerns, dangerous procedures, um, you know, things like uh, G-Shot enhancement, uh, 
even laser treatment, uh, you know, I don't want to be a Monday morning quarterback, but I've seen a lot of complications. Uh, and really about this concept of return to science and return to understanding uh, and really understand that certainly, um, you know, pioneers get slaughtered and settlers get land and we do need people to be innovative and think about new uh, therapeutic venues, but we need to do it in a methodical way to prevent dangerous things from happening. And again, some uh, things have been embraced uh, and they don't really have a lot of science or data to support it. Um, with telehealth uh, and the movement, there's been a lot of discussion about this, about do, well, do you think that we're going to move back to uh, uh, patients in person? And my personal opinion, and I'd love to hear what other people think, is that we are, we are here in a new telehealth industry uh, and it's here to stay. It's not going to go away. Um, it's for convenience. I think a lot of people can be managed remotely um, with a proper definition. Right now I have two offices. One is completely remote. So after I'm done today, I'll have 15 uh, telehealth visits, um, which um, is uh, quite uh, big for a, a, a long day. Uh, and I have another office where people can come in and get uh, appropriate care. So I think people are picking and choosing uh, and I think technology and healthcare is inevitable to stay very closely intertwined. Um, and this is just kind of a little bit about, about uh, the science concept. We're looking more towards uh, how not just embrace concepts like CBD or contraception and how it affects sexuality, but looking at position statements, a lot of societies and journals have really embraced this concept. Uh, we know that even for same-sex behavior, we're looking at more of a scientific approach rather than just a theoretical social support uh, concept. So the, the ideas of moving towards uh, a science-based, evidence-based uh, technology and women's health is very much prevalent. Um, there's been a really an interesting resurgence about the concept of research and placebo. And I think the Im important take home message for many people to realize is the more invasive the intervention, the more perceived benefit and henceforth the more placebo effect. So a pill has less placebo than an injection, than a, less than a minimally invasive procedure, less than surgery. And again, I think there's been a lot of restudy on this placebo effect. What is really a true placebo? What is not a placebo? And again, for us who are interested in the um, device world, we really need to recognize that if we have studies that separate from placebo, we really are showing an effect, a really true effect, because the placebo effect is so high. If you look here, minimally invasive procedures, like a laser or radio frequency, very, very high placebo effect. So if our data supports a separation from that, it really must be a true um, uh, issue. So I think very, very important to uh, recognize that facet as well. Um, this is one of the vaginal technologies really being looked at. It's vaginal photoplasmography, which is looks at arousal, blood flow, uh, and again, very uh, objective measures of improved uh, circulation in the vaginal area. There's been studies, if you look uh, thermography, you can see that there's changes in blood flow with devices. So again, we're moving more towards an objective measure. This has been around for quite some time. Now the challenge is sometimes these objective measures don't correlate necessarily with subjective uh, improvement, but you can really uh, demonstrate from an objective manner that you may be increasing blood flow, increasing the integrity of the underlying genital treatment. And we know that we know that uh, sexuality is a combination of biology and psychology. So, you know, very often we have to fine tune both aspects of the uh, paradigm to show uh, very good improvement. 
This is an interesting, uh, another one, an interesting interface where we are now seeing, uh, this is a handheld, um, a handheld ultrasound device that is not available, it's investigational, they're doing all kinds of treatments now, um, getting funding for vaginal dryness. But the concern is, um, you know, you have to use it daily for eight minutes uh, for 12 weeks. So we'll talk about that concept in a little bit as I uh, bring forth forward other um, information about these home devices, the time commitment, the extent of Delivery. So we're we're interested in the concept of um, you know uh, of technology and treating conditions, and some people are thinking that home health use is appropriate. But we're seeing with home health use, we need daily using on a consistent basis for quite some time. And that not, might not necessarily be very compatible to other um, uh, situations. Um, I want to go backwards a little bit and then kind of uh, spring forward. We talked a little bit about the FDA um, in 2018 issued this whole concept of um, about energy-based devices uh, performed for vaginal rejuvenation, cosmetic procedures, and they had this uh, safety consideration. Some, some uh, organizations were sanctioned, uh, making false claims, and marketing really got ahead of science. And I think that's where we had some concerns and some considerations. And I think we're back um, to kind of a stable level where um, we're still really trying to embrace science. And again, there were a lot of articles coming out. One actually happened to be mine, which made national news. Really, it was called Rethinking the Techno Vagina Case Series of Laser Complications. It was fast tracked and published in Menopause Journal. Um, there was concerns about burns. This came out on the same time as The Bleeding Edge, which was really a Netflix original, a Netflix movie. Um, if um, any of you have had the opportunity, it would be a great uh, time to look through that. Uh, but again, a lot of backlash about embracing technology without the science to back back it up, and again, uh, marketing uh, really superseded science, and then there's been some pullback in terms of treatment. And uh, I know I just got a call from a colleague of mine in Canada. Their, the Canadian uh, doc is um, pushing uh, laser treatment and the concept of you can't, there's nothing else available that's safe and effective. Uh, and I think is charging 3000 Canadian dollars for the three uh, treatments. So again, I think uh, everybody is kind of at this point where science is really important. And there has really been this resurgence and backlash when people are talking about this cosmetic uh, vagina, the designer vagina. Uh, so again, I think the terms that we use are really important. Cosmetic gynecology, uh, rejuvenation, uh, really have gotten a bad rap, um, and a lot of organizations, including, um, you know, American Urological Gynecological Society, ACOG, they have all come out with different kinds of statements about this, and this was in December, not too long ago, about um, when procedures should be done, tread cautiously, uh, informed consent, uh, for clinicians to look at science and data, which was really quite critical. I wanted to switch a little bit and just kind of refresh everybody's memory about Viviv 1, which was the randomized uh, sham control trial. Uh, women started off at a baseline of, FS, of, a, of a mean FSFI score of about 22. Normal is about 26.5. And again, we see a clear distinction between the treatment arm and the sham arm as well. And, you know, I think it's really important to kind of know your responders. So people that have, remember, sexuality is a multifaceted approach. Um, this, I really believe this is not for people that have severe um, 
female sexual dysfunction. Bruno of severe may have an underlying severe medical, biological, hormonal uh, dysfunction, and they may also have a, a, a huge component in terms of psychological issues that have uh, been problematic as well. So again, this is where the FSFI separated for the Viviv 1 for the sexuality treatment. And again, we look at arousal and orgasm. And again, this makes good sense because again, you're doing the treatment right behind the um, hymenal opening at the clitoral arms and improves integrity with transmission to the, um, improves integrity to the uh, body of the clitoris, which would improve arousal and orgasmic response. And we've seen that clinically in our, um, in our patient population. And again, uh, one of the other things to remember is many of the studies that we've seen, they say, oh, there's no adverse events. And that's impossible. You know, if you look at a laser study and they say there's no adverse events, we followed people for six months, that already tells the reviewers, the scientists, the people that understand research that this is a false study. Why? You cannot follow women for six months and not have adverse events. People fall, people get uh, yeast infections, they have headaches, they have abnormal bleeding. They may have no um, issues related to the treatment. So be very cautious when you read that. So we did have some uh, adverse events, but again, you can see here, very comparable. And actually, um, you know, the active treatment had lower uh, AEs than the sham. Um, and subsequently, this led to a very big meeting, which I attended in February of 2019. I've sat on this committee where they really looked at vaginal rejuvenation position statements from the uh, European Society of Sexual Medicine, which sets the guidelines for the uh, European countries as well as uh, nationally and internationally. Um, and it would be a very good read to go through. And they really said that radio frequency is superior to uh, any other treatment for sexual health, given the uh, data that we have seen. Um, and again, it goes through the, the, the issues when you look at uh, SUI and it goes through the issues of laser uh, as well. And again, we're not, this lecture is not going to talk about the differences between laser and radio frequency. I know you're all well versed in that, but I think it's really important to recognize that there are differences. Um, I wanted to kind of talk a little bit more about this about Viviv and why it separates it out. And this is kind of a new, the new technological phase of Viviv um, where we now know uh, and have really understood that, that um, cryogen uh, or the cooling aspects has, um, has a, a direct effect on the tissue as well. So it's a synergistic issue. His, here's some of the background information. Cryotherapy is transient cooling, for those of you who are not sure, uh, or just a quick refresher. So Viviv cools and then it heats and then uh, that makes it very different than just a regular heating. So we know collagen one and uh, three in one ratio increases after transient cooling. Heat shock proteins and stress proteins are synthesized when they're exposed to stressors, including cold shock. So, um, you know, and cold shock proteins are produced in response to changing environmental conditions to stabilize potential harmful effects. So this, think about yourself when you go outside and you're cold, you start to have biological changes, you know, that are trying to compensate for the coldness. So you're trying to heat your body back up before you get frozen. So transient coolness causes biological changes. That's probably the easiest way to dis discuss it. And the gene expression produced by moderate hypothermia, not fully known, but appear to differ important ways produced by heat shock during warming. So it's very different when you are outside and you're in prolonged cold, what happens biologically versus a transient, and then you return to heat. And that's an important concept to think about. So these are our understanding of, of really about what is happening. So there's a thermogenic reaction 
Um, you know, transient cooling causes a drop in temperature and a compensatory thermogenic reaction. So you're getting a duality effect. You're cooling the tissues and the tissues are being forced to reheat, plus you're doing the reheating right a uh, few um, moments thereafter. And the localized heat producing proteins, the human cryogens, act to compensate for drop in the temperature. And there's a lot of indiv individual variation between these um, concepts. So neuroprotection, the nerves are protected. Neuroprotection has been documented by transient hypothermia. Response to cooling may be localized. And I think the important concept is if, if you take Marianne and put her outside, who someone who's lived in, you know, the Northeast for a very, very long time, her thermic reaction will be very different if you take me and put me out there. Yes, I lived in Montreal for 25 years, but I have not gone back when it's super cold. So remember the inter uh, individual variation to response to cold is very different. You can have two people in the same room and it's 72 degrees, one person is shivering and one person is wearing a tank top. And I think that's an important concept to remember that everyone's experience of heat and cold is individualized. And that's an important concept, especially with the Viv treatment, that you're doing both of those concepts. I wanted to let you know, this is right off the presses, we did, in order to prove this, we did a three-arm study, okay, where we had uh, RF and cooling, cryogen only, and nothing. We did it in three sites, 36 patients, premenopausal women with moderate SUI, changed from baseline at the one-hour pad weight, and followed adverse events. And this is hot off the press just recently, um, the press release went out yesterday, and we know the active decreased 9.5 grams per ml, cryo only sham minus 6.8, and the inert sham minus 4.4 grams. So we know that the cryogen has an effect, and we know that um, cooling monopolar radio frequency has a great effect um, as well, uh, more than just the cryo alone. So this is giving us a better understanding of our placebo, right? So we have a, a clear path forward to understand that if someone just gets the cryo, they're gonna have a reaction. So an inert sham is what we need, and that is giving us a very clear path forward for our SUI program going forward. And I would just also add that the animal studies, the histochemical studies, really support this concept as well. So this is really exciting stuff, hot off the press. You're probably the first people to hear it. Um, the other thing about technology I wanted to also mention is this, you know, home device. We talked about the home vaginal device. We talked about vibrators. We talked about dilators. We talked about other things for urinary incontinence. And you're supposed to use it five minutes a day, every day for six weeks. Not only is it pretty expensive, but this five minutes per day, every day for six weeks is really critical. Same kind of concept with, um, apex, dilators, intensity, different things. The difference with these is this actually gives you the stimulation, right? Um, versus the um, other device that was just FDA approved is you have to actually do the contraction. This is one step forward for you uh, as well. But, you know, I was trying to find the best way to explain this. And I think this is the number one way that we say we all have good intentions of doing something every single day, whether it's the treadmill, whether it is taking our medication, uh, and we do not do it. So the concept of compliance is really, really challenging. And I, I you know, some of the things, you know, um, I think everybody is going to be very happy to see 2020 go, and we're going to all have great resolutions. Uh, only 25% of us actually stay committed. After 30 days, 8% accomplish them. Um, over 50% don't follow uh, medication regimens, which are life-threatening. Preventing of cancer, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, 
Um, 25% of us don't fill our prescriptions that we need. We can't read our labels. So the concept of compliance is very, very important. And um, not to sound pejorative, but North American women and people in general want a quick fix. They do not want to be committed for five minutes every day for six weeks. It's cumbersome because it's not really five weeks. Five, five minutes, right? Let's really be honest because you have, to, you have to go into your room, lock the door, get the things out, do your exercises, yes, for five minutes, then you've got to take them out, then you've got to clean them. So we're talking 15 to 30 minutes daily. And I don't know if uh, compliance is going to be uh, very, very um, uh, high given the fact that we know that compliance is very low for life-threatening issues, even like taking a pill. Um, and we all have gadgets um, that are lying around that we haven't used. Um, you know, I uh, found this picture, and this is actually a picture in my house. I have a gazillion different, I have an iTouch, iPhone, iPads, all kinds of things. The latest fad that, um, you know, an iPad, a, a Nano or whatever they're called. Um, we all have those latest fads and want to get the latest and greatest machine and we end up not using them and other things come back there forward. So there is no such thing as a free lunch. I think the concept of getting a treatment and being done, uh, one and done is very, very important. We know that compliance with a one-time dose medication is exceptionally high comparatively to a three or four day course. And we also know that with a laser. A lot of women come for their first treatment and they don't come for their second or third. And that's why we're seeing a shift towards most clinicians saying you got to pay for all three up front. They recognize that some people get better after one and they don't want to come back. So again, uh, think about compliance and patient acceptance when you're thinking about uh, procedures that you're going to offer and do. Uh, and we know that uh, patients don't always listen to what we tell them in terms of medication and compliance and, and stuff. And I know that I do dilators very, very often for women who have uh, vaginal stenosis, cancer therapy, and what have you. And um, we know that they, uh, we mark it down, we tell them, we spend a half an hour discussing it, and they come back and they haven't really grasped the idea. The only thing that has been shown to be helpful for dilators is repetitive learning and frequent visits every four weeks to help them on track. So compliance with um, procedures, medical treatments is exceptionally low and we need to kind of factor that in as we uh, discuss treatment options with our patients. Um, this has kind of been the trend of sexuality, technology, um, we saw a really huge wave of technology with laser and radio frequency. And then with the FDA, we saw a crash, reversal, and now we're seeing a rediscovery where there's now more science-based stuff, randomized sham controlled trials. Um, you're seeing physicians tread cautiously. Insurance companies have caught up and saying, you want to do laser, that's fine. There's no, you have a complication, we're not covering you. There is now a resurgence of knowledge is power and science is power as well. So I would encourage looking at the data and understanding that and, in, and provide informed consent for your patients as well. Um, just some last quick slides and then we can open it up for some questions. Um, I always say you can fool all the people some of the time, some of the people um, all the time, but you cannot fool all the people all the time. Science will always prevail and data will always prevail in terms of uh, medical care for our patients. Um, and I would also say be careful who you follow blindly um, and uh, be careful when you blindly follow the masses. Sometimes the M is silent and just because everybody is doing laser doesn't mean laser is appropriate. Um, and just because everybody is prescribing one medication doesn't necessarily mean that it's the appropriate one for this specific patient. So uh, use your best clinical judgment, use science, and, uh, and uh, data will prevail. And with that, I'm going to conclude. I will open up the floor to questions um, 
and uh, we can go from this. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was really insightful. I do have a few questions. So one of which was, what was interesting to me is how you were saying that uh, a lot of individuals are, uh, are, are thinking to themselves that anything that is non-invasive, pain-free, no downtime is associated with something that is not um, effective. So how are you dealing with that at your clinic and why do you feel Viviv is a, is a great solution for that? How do you approach those types of inquiries or those reservations that people have? Um, well, I think it's just the, you know, the bottom line is you just have to, um, um, you just have to kind of get to this concept of uh, having a good relationship with your patients. I think, you know, you could, most of them will come in for one procedure and uh, be treated. They, you know, I think you have to lay down the positives and negatives of each procedure um, and individualize. And again, I think that's the, the biggest concept. This is quick, easy, safe, effective. Um, there's, there's no downtime um, and it's not gonna be disruptive, right? So again, you, you know, most of the patients that I see are active and vibrant, busy women. They, mm -hmm. you know, they're running corporations or running a family or homeschooling or doing all kinds of stuff. Um, working in the home, out of the home, they don't have the time to do the time, number one, for self-care, and they don't have the time to do something on a daily basis. So they are very, very interested in this kind of uh, fix, I would, mm. so to speak. Yeah, I, I know that you you also provided some stats during our last webinar when we did straight talk on sexual dysfunction. Uh, so can you actually reiterate some of those stats? Uh, there was one that you had stated here for those that missed our last session. I think you said, it, I think I'm just looking at it right here. I think it was 60% of women uh, value sexual um, activity at home. Like they want to have more sex and they're not able to have it. And they value that more than their careers and all of these other elements of their lives. And seeing as it's so important, you know, all the more reason why sexual health and, and sexual intimate treatments should be at the forefront and become more of a mainstream go-to treatment for women out there. Right, and I mean, sexual health is general health. And I mean, I think people, women are not gonna volunteer that, but if you yeah. bring up the discussion and say, you know, the, the concept is, how do you bring up that discussion? And I think it's important to recognize that, um, um, that the the concept of sexuality and sexual health is very important mm -hmm. and sex has a lot of far-reaching implications for a biological phenomena stress relief sleep lower rates of cancer increased longevity increased compliance with medication but it also has a huge psychological benefit for mm -hmm. the relationship um, so a lot of women value it for a variety of different reasons. It's not only the biological concept and they kind of get into this concept of learned helplessness. So if you bring up the topic, you'd be surprised about the answers. And uh, yeah, definitely women are very, very interested in um, sexuality, sexual health, maintaining that health as well. You know, I think that's yeah. really important. And so based on some studies that I've come across, because I've also been very curious about this topic, and I've been told and I've seen that, um, you know, women or men for that matter, anyone who seeks pornography or toys or watches uh, videos and things like that, and it's almost like an individual will develop a habit or uh, not necessarily a habit, but a, a dependence on these, on these toys or these other external means when as you mentioned many times before and even in the last in the previous webinar you mentioned a lot of this is mental it's a it's, it's a psychological aspect too that ties into all of this right so how do you how do you promote uh, sex tech as being as something that is something that you know is obviously evident and, and very um, prominent in people's lives but how do you get them to not get so attached to these toys so that they can rely on themselves to achieve the natural lubrication and, and achieve that sensuality well, that they, they need? It's, it's kind of like everything, you know, you can take your iPhone and talk about the good, the bad, the ugly. And I think, mm -hmm. 
you have to give people perspective of this is these are typically therapeutic devices for either for treatment or for enhancement. Um, and again, it's the overall approach that it's biology and psychology. And sometimes these are like sexual aids. It's kind of like, you know, sometimes you need them all the time, like a, a like a leg brace uh, when yeah. your leg is not working properly. You might need a leg brace, but sometimes you need only need crutches. <laughs> yeah. So they may only be intermittent. Mm -hmm. So again, it's the perspective. And very often, I think that's setting up um, when you have your discussion with your patients, it's setting up realistic expectations. You know, <laughs> it's like, this is what we're anticipating. This is what we're going to do. This is how long we're going to do it for. This is when we're going to follow up. This is the expected duration. And sometimes, you know, like I have people who are on hormones and they say, how long am I going to be on? And I say a lifetime, <laughs> you know. Um, you know, I have women that can't achieve an orgasm and they need a vibrator and I, they say, how long am I going to need it? I said, well, if it's not broken, don't fix it. It's fixed with this vibrator, right? <laughs> so again, it depends on the context. So you have to set the context, set the expectation and have realistic expectations as well. Mm, yeah, that's a great point. And so I guess to, uh, to wrap this up, another question I have for you is what is your, if you had to advise a, a customer that comes to you specifically to be treated for, um, you know, she wants tissue tightening and, and obviously strengthening uh, the stress urinary incontinence, all of these different factors, but also wants to achieve more orgasms and all of that. So is there, is there a specific, in, in conjunction with a Viviv treatment, is there a specific go-to toy or something of that nature that you would recommend as sort of, and not one size fits all, but is there something you would go to usually? There, there is a lot of, you know, it depends. So you have to kind of get it, you know, sexuality and sexual response is such an individual experience. Yeah. Um, you know, 70% of women like direct clitoral response to, to the direct clitoral stimulation, but of those 70%, some like pressure, some like high intensity, mm. some like low intensity. So you really have to, you know, there's not one, there's different toys that have different, you know, um, insights and different functions, but there's all kinds of ones. There's wearable mm. ones, there's small ones, <laughs> there's big ones, there's high tech <laughs> ones, there's ones that you can work from your phone, you know, there's all kinds of things. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I think you have to individualize. I mean, I do like some of the, I like the Lioness, I like Lilo, I like Mystery Vibe. They have bendable ones, they have individual ones. So again, and I think part of the concept for women <clears throat> and men especially is they don't know what rocks their world, you know? So they have to, <laughs> they have to sexual experiment. Yeah. Um, and they have to learn about their response, mm -hmm. learn about their bodies, you know? And it's not one vibrator fits all. It's some people need more than one vibrator. Yeah. yeah. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> and we don't have to go into the, those details for today. Well, that'll be the next uh, the, the next webinar. So there's a question that came in that I feel a lot of people would benefit from. So um, how many Viviv treatments do you recommend for improved orgasm and laxity versus incontinence? And again, I would individualize. So, yeah. you know, again, the concept is I use a, is, as a multifaceted layered approach. So people will get the treatment, but they also get local estrogen, they get enhancers, they get vibrators. I'm a layer kind of guy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, you know, and it's like, um, you know, I walked into my kids, um, uh, bathroom and in the shower my daughter has seven bottles of shampoo so I say to her why do you have seven bottles of shampoo how are you going to tell which one is working to keep your hair the way you want it to care if you're using yeah. them all and you're not using one consistently so I'm a layer kind of guy you do one thing and then you layer something on and layer something on and you find out what the best synergy of treatments are so usually one treatment I offer I, I follow them up in one month and in three months i offer them the same price at one at for a repeat at six months i don't repeat it before six months and in that interim we may add other things as well or take things away mm -hmm. and very much individualized same kind of concept and i think the important thing is to 
recognize and set realistic patient expectations. Mm -hmm. They are not going to become these sex fiends who are lurking by the water cooler waiting for sex <laughs> every minute. Okay. It may be a very, uh, sometimes in sex, a very small change means a very large difference. Mm, yeah, that's so. great. A lot of great takeaways there. Yeah. Um, so that's it for the, the general questions. I think, uh, yeah, this is really insightful. And I think it's one element to a bigger piece. I mean, and I love your approach. Right. It's very holistic. It does, you're not just treating, um, you know, tightening and strengthening. You're, you're actually catering to people's needs and addressing some concerns that nobody really wants to talk about. And I feel like you're the, I just love your approach. You know, you're, you're doing a, a really great job at, at sort of getting rid of that stigma or at least making it more approachable as a topic. So thank you. Great. Yeah. Perfect. Okay, well, that's I knew you a were a little anxious about the talk and wasn't, <laughs> weren't, weren't, weren't really sure how it was going to go, but I think, I think it turned out okay. No, I think it was actually really, really great and insightful. And I think, it, you know, yeah. we need to talk about these things. This is what, this is what we're dealing with today. So I love the, right. the fact that you're innovative. So thank you right. very much for joining it's us. My pleasure. And hopefully we can schedule some more in the future. Yes. <laughs> Sounds good. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, guys. Have a great day. And Bye, we'll, everyone. Uh, we'll definitely keep in touch. And if you have any questions or concerns, please uh, let me know. Okay? Wonderful. Okay. Take Bye, care, everybody. Bye-bye.